Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you, or sorry, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for attending our webinar today. Just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, we will be recording today's session. Um, everyone who is registered will get an email and a link to the on-demand version and a copy of today's presentation. Uh, slides within the next few days. Uh, this session will run for about 60 minutes, which includes time for Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A panel on your GoToWebinar console so that we can address them towards the end of the presentation. If for some reason we don't have time to address all of your questions uh, in today's live event, please be assured that we will follow up with you directly after the webinar. Um, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today for missing the link in supply chain planning. My name is Bill Bruton and I am account executive at Shea Global. I have over 10 years experience uh, working uh, by working with uh, clients, aligning solutions to some of the most pressing business needs. The topic of today's webinar should be very interesting to anyone looking for ideas on how to improve their supply chain responsiveness. Um, to meet customer demand. I'm certain you'll enjoy the presentation today. I'll be your host uh, for the webinar. And as part of the hosting duties, uh, I will quickly introduce our presenter uh, and our company. Uh, starting with our company, uh, a little bit about Shea. Uh, Shea, uh, we challenge customers to look beyond the status quo to make their business better. And we believe every business has the potential for excellence. Uh, we are passionate about guiding our customers to achieving their highest potential. Uh, we are an essential service according to the province, uh, province of Ontario. Uh, we'll continue to stay open to our uh, service our clients um, um, during this uh, during this time, and uh, we we provide ERP, CRM, business intelligence, and demand driven technologies and solutions focused on transforming supply chains. Shea Global supports organizations in 25 countries and offices in Canada, US, UK, India, and the Philippines. Our team consists of many experts with lots of experience uh, across many different verticals. Um, and those would include aerospace, defense, automotive, consumer goods, um, electronics, fashion, food and beverage, machinery and equipment, medical devices, chemical, plastic and rubber, and also pharmaceuticals. And now I'd like to introduce, without further de a delay, um, our speaker today, Roberta McPhail. Roberta is an Apex and DDMRP master instructor and currently an independent consultant with 30 years of experience on continuous improvement. She has extensive cross-functional experience in all levels of supply chain, including project scheduling, master scheduling, repetitive and lean scheduling, demand management, international procurement, distribution planning and MRP, MRP systems, uh, MRP, ERP systems, excuse me. Uh, welcome Roberta and thank you for sharing your insight today. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good morning everybody from sunny Vancouver, Canada. And uh, as we as we hidey hole in our offices, I always like to stick my head out of the window every morning and hopefully things are opening up for us here in, in, in BC here and the rest of the world. So hopefully we're seeing the end of the of the COVID situation, so hope we're all being safe. And thank you for the introduction to, uh, thanks for the introduction, Bill, and thank you to Shay for, for having me as a speaker for this. Uh, I'll just kind of add on to uh, what you said about me, just 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 to preface my, my, my experience on this. Uh, I am an APEX instructor, demand-driven instructor, a demand and also a demand driven implementer so i work with industry i have actually done many demand driven implementations so uh, i just say that so to say that i have real experience in this so and i'll give you the benefit of some of that experiences as i go through so today we're going to cover review of inventory systems what is ddmrp what's all the buzz what's all the bug why was this made some nuts and bolts stuff from a planner's perspective just to give you enough taste about kind of planning the issues between buffers and safety stock. Talk about that. What companies and industries are doing this? Tools and uh, next steps and free resources. Everybody likes free, so there you go. Okay, window change. Do I have control? No, yes, I do. Okay. Oops. Do I have control? There we go. Okay. Um, so what's the challenge? So the as as we think about the you know the 
and I'm very passionate about, Bill and I were talking earlier before this started, and I, I think people have lost the basics of what inventory management is. We have tons of tools, and we and it is a key element to every supply chain from manufacturing to, to distribution. You gotta have the right inventory. And we're obviously seeing a stress on the inventory supply chain with the COVID, COVID situation. Um, but it is key to every company's smooth running is having the right inventory, the right place, at the right time. And we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about inventory from the point of view of having a green zone here, this range of inventory, and 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 getting ahead a little bit. So that's what DDMRP does is tries to optimize and run the range. And um, we have different inventory systems that take different approaches to this. So next slide. Do I have control? I I don't think I do. Um, so here is the uh, a standard demand supply volume mix. This is taught by Apex and Supply Chain Canada and other. This is uh, another different view. This has been taught for 50 years. You plan the top, plan forecast, do SNOP in the middle here, uh, master potentially master schedule, feed it through in MRP systems, uh, forecasting on one side, resource capacity planning on the other side. That is what has been the standard for many years. Um, so the the re replenishment. Um, uh, so I'm just going to talk about this is my list uh, about the different systems that I see being used. So we're talking about rotor points, lean Kanban, time phased MRP, uh, event optimizational tools, and then we'll talk about DMRP, which is the bulk of the presentation today. Next slide, please. Let's talk about rotor point. My favorite rotor point, the most probably still widely most used. Inventory goes down, hit a trigger point, inventory comes in, brings it back up, down and up, down and up, called the sawtooth. And then we have our front EOQ, which is determining the, and this has been around since Henry Ford days, the most standard method for doing rotor points. Okay, next slide. Kanban has, uh, everyone knows about lean, everybody knows about just in time, and everybody knows you make parts as you need it, or you pull and based on a pull signal, and there's different variety of different methodologies around Kanban, individual bins, or using a control, a control board with cards, and the cards uh, create pull signals. Next slide. Oops. Uh, MRP obviously has been around since uh, MRP has been around since sliced bread in the late 50s, early 60s, commercialized in the 70s. We'll talk more about that. And basically using a bill of materials, you do a time phase plan um, and traditionally using a forecast at the top level and driving through an MRP calculation. Uh, that is the tool that is inherently built in with most ERP systems, right? Okay, so that's the other tool we have. Okay, um, I just put this slide in APO module. That's the that's the name of the actually the SAP one. Uh, CISPRO has inventory optimization modules, but there's lots of modules that try to optimize supply chain. And you do it traditional ways. You do forecast accuracy over time, 95% confidence level, blah blah blah, exponential smoothing, blah blah blah, and then you get this thing that kicks out orders for you. That is another tool that has existed in, in the industry. And on now we're finally getting to demand-driven MRP. Okay, so that's what the bulk of this, this presentation will be. And it's talk about, and I just wanted to cover the previous ones to get your brains aligned to what I thought was the traditional standard standard systems. Um, we can talk about the good and the bad and the ugly of how they work, but I will touch on that more. So it's all based on, this all started, the DDMRP thing, all started with a re-examination of MRP. So MRP was basically built in the 1950s and again, some of the old timers in supply chain, no offense to my friend, the old timers, they stacks of cards, went into the mainframe, load the cards into the mainframe, you know, and then um, waited a whole weekend for the MRP run and the planners would come in with a big giant stack of printed out paper, perforated paperwork, and that was what MRP was. And then in the 80s and 90s, we got high running uh, client server PCs, and this was the tool. This was pretty much the only tool we had for optimizing supply chains was MRP with safety stuff, right? But 
we have a problem. With MRP, many companies, or when I say MRP, it could also mean uh, reorder point or min max or even uh, maybe some lean systems. But even with that, we're still using a proliferation of spreadsheets is huge. Here are 63 to 84%. And we all know, we all know the problem. The good news of spreadsheets is they're highly customizable, right? It's the ultimate customizable tool. The bad thing about spreadsheets is a customizable tool. And we know that all, all spreadsheets have errors. You start linking data, you start linking fields, you start doing complex V lookups, you start doing SQL queries in the spreadsheets. It becomes a it becomes a, a challenge to keep spreadsheets accurate. And it is, I've spent more energy, for years I was a director of supply chain planning and in supply chain, and I was, my mandate was like getting rid of spreadsheets. Like it was causing so much chaos. So we have a problem. So this says our tools are not working. Uh, no offense to my friends in the ERP, but we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on tools and now we're still using spreadsheets to plan a billion, a million dollar business. Something's wrong, okay? So the problem is, because of this and, and because of the nature of spreadsheets, because of the natures of safety stock, because of the natures how, how the calculations work and everyone knows about nervousness and the bulk effect internally with MRP systems, we get this oscillation effect of either too little or too much. And that is not good. And we're seeing most companies that do DMRP are reporting this to a high degree of effect. And usually we see this at least half the inventory is not in the optimal range. I'm making a general state, a generality here, but we want to get it into, we want to fix this. And we're saying a lot of companies that implement DDMRP are reporting this issue. Um, and this is because of the nature of the logic of the tools. So, so demand-driven MRP came onto the landscape. And I'm well aware of the, I'm well aware of the, oh my God, we got another system, another drink the Kool-Aid, another methodology, and I was very, <laughs> you know, we've got uh, lean guys saying this system's the best. These guys say this system's the best. And demand driven says, no, this system's the best. But let me try to explain why this is good. And uh, this is the book. You can you can get this. You can just Google this on Amazon. You can get the, the book, Carol Patak, Chad Smith, are the founders of DDMRP. And then actually was first published in 2011. And this book has three chapters. This is the Bible for MRP systems. And uh, basically, Demand driven MRP, this is the most complex definition I'll talk about today. It's a method to model and plan supply chains to protect and promote the flow of relevant information, right? We want flow. Flow gives us a return on investment. DDMRP uses strategic decoupling points to drive supply order generation and management throughout the supply chain. So decoupling points will replace safety stock. And um, there is a strategic process for where we put those decoupling points and how we managed the big difference between MRP safety stock and uh, DDMRP buffers is that buffers dampen variability. Safety stock does not, okay? Um, so what are the, so the, uh, the founders, the authors, the, uh, the gurus who have built this complete system is uh, they board on MRP. Do we still need bills and materials and, and some bomb calculations? Absolutely. DRP pulse systems for plunge distribution centers. Yes, borrow that. Lean. Lean has been talking about pulse synchronized pulse systems for years. Absolutely bang on. Okay. Some of the lean optimizational tools are very good. And you know, the basics of uh, you know of, of, of lean and waste improvement, but leading to flow. Lean's been talking about this for a long time. Theory constraints with Eli Goldratt. Um, those are familiar with TOC is very popular, very popular, very powerful management thinking process. A large amount of this has been brought into uh, DDMRP systems. Six Sigma with process variation. This is your uh, lean, lean Six Sigma black belt stuff. And, the pro and we're going to show you how this applies within DDMRP models. Okay. And innovational thinking primarily around the issue that uh, supply chains are not simple linear systems. They are called what's called complex adaptive systems. And you need a methodology that can handle a volatile, crazy world such as COVID. And, and, and so DDMRP borrows on that. So we have a tagline. If you ever get a t-shirt called position, protect, and pull, position the inventory, protect that inventory, and pull on real time. And so this is what has been around. So it's uh, first published in 2011. I've been involved with this from the early days and I'm very excited about it. Um, it works. So let's, 
So just, just talking about, and I don't have enough time, I would need another hour to really guide dive into this. So just, just be aware that what we're gonna talk about today is really this box here, the manager of an operating model. This is where what's called buffers exist. This is where we position inventory and buffers. And, um, and then we do have demand driven SNOP processes and adaptive processes for strategic versus for strategic. This is replacing the standard industry SNOP processes. And we have this all fully defined and there's textbooks and there's books and all this stuff. And, um, and, some, and some of the software is even certified in DD SNOPs to help you do uh, management around that, which is really interesting because I think the industry's had a hard time with integrating tactical and strategic SNOP. Actual demand one end, market innovation the other end, variance management, and then model tuning back and forth in between the tactical and the strategic. So, so here is the here is the we call this the five components of DMRP. And uh, uh, those who attended John Melby's uh, presentation a week or two ago on uh, was uh, DDMRP 101. Uh, he, some of my slides have overlapped with him. Um, basically, this is our kind of our implementation path. This is the basics. This is what we teach in the training courses. Um, so step one, I'm going to go through each of these. Uh, first, we strategically decouple. Then we set buffer profiles. Then we dynamically adjust, which most other systems don't do. Plan, we need something to trigger work orders and purchase orders. And, and we need something to trigger uh, execution, either on distribution, replenishment, or manufacturing orders. I'll touch on all that. Okay. So strategic decoupling. So what we do in DDMRP is we actually take a complete view of the uh, either within a, a factory or in a holistic supply chain, and we go through and we actually put a, a decision where this is a symbol for a buffer. And basically the reason why we do this is that it actually well the graphic got a little chopped here, but the basically what we do is we put a buffer in place so the variability doesn't pass all the way through. And the nodes of the supply chain or the departments within a factory. The buffer stops the variability. That's the big, big, because, because you dampen it down, you actually have a chance to win. Okay? So once we've set the buffers in place, and here's, oh, sorry, here's another view. So you know, a plant could be like looking like this on the left, which case, in, and with an MRP type configuration, you have a what's called cumulative lead time. Everything's tightly dependently coupled together through the MRP structures and you forecast and plan at the top and boom, 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 MRP does its thing, crazy, crazy. And then the purchasing people usually at the back end going, oh my God, what's happening? And they, and it's called MRP nervousness and it's a challenge. So then we do spreadsheets or we do extra safety stock, which causes more problems. So in demand driven land, uh, demand driven land is we make a decision of where to put the buffers. And by doing that, we're chopping the lead time into, into what we call it strategically decouple. Then we actually put the chop. Uh, so there's a process that we teach, um, the process we teach about where this is. And quite often, it's very common sense, right? And um, But then the way that the buffers are managed and the way that triggers or punishment is totally different than MRP safety stuff. Hello. Oops. I can jump the slide here. There we go. So here's the, uh, so we're finally into what a buffer is. So a buffer, every stocked position of inventory is now called a buffer. Every buffer will have three colored zones. It is, there's mathematic, very simple mathematical rules. Give me an hour and I can teach you about them. Uh, below, you can see the schema. You can see the schema will be used, uh, the data schema. And um, so basically every part has color coded, color codes and, um, and, Basically, the main input is ADU, average daily usage, which is obviously your historical consumption of demand. You could use forecasted daily usage if you if, if it's more of an independent demand um, uh, sold item. Certainly, a lot of our clients actually use FDU instead of ADU. So sometimes, depending on the variability of, of the part, doesn't need to be absolutely perfect. It just has to be roughly right. So once we have buffers in place, we now do the math and we get a stack profile for each part, and it's pretty cool. And then the inventory will play within this buffer profile and the planning will play within this buffer profile. Okay, and I'm not gonna go through all the math here. Uh, big, big thing is buffers are designed to hold inventory, MRP by itself without safety stock nets to zero. And that's the big change here. We plan to have inventory on purpose and we're protecting to have inventory close to 100% availability, okay? Okay, 
And so here we go. So we need to adjust. So once we have buffers in place, so like, so my question is, should we adjust the buffers? And the answer is obviously yes. And then I'll just say, well, what about safety stock and reorder points? How often do companies look at that data? In some cases, never. In some cases, it's a semi-manual annual process. That's not, but it's, in some cases, there are tools that dynamically adjust safety stock. But within demand-driven, buffer adjustment is built in natively to our system, okay? Demand goes up, buffers are gonna get bigger. You may have a seasonal thing here. And then the question is, if you had a COVID type scenario, you would start seeing the buffers start degrading and then you could actually theoretically, now, no system is gonna fix your supply problems with the COVID situation, but at least the visibility will be there and you can make some decisions on how that works. And, and when we uh, teach this stuff and the softwares that support it has all the tools to manage these buffers very dynamically and the color coding really helps. So, so we do we dynamically adjust buffers? Yes, and we do it pretty much daily to weekly uh, adjustments. Roberta, just a quick um, interjection on that. Um, is that a key difference here with um, um, rear point systems versus DDMRP, that um, uh, static versus dynamic effect? Uh, the, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, it is, and 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 it's because the nature of how to how do we optimize inventory really is the underlying question, and what the what the what the 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 system is designed around is that we should dynamically adjust all the time. Okay, now people get a little scared by that, saying, "Oh my God, it's going to go crazy." Well, no, there's an averaging technique, and there's some there's some you know some smoothing things that we do here. Um, yeah, so yes, we adjust. Most people don't. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, then we got to create a, uh, uh, a replenishment. So replenishment. So this is what creates. So this is what creates your purchase order or your work order, right? Or your distribution order replenishment. You're going to use actual demand, which is really sales orders. Deeper in your bills and materials will be actual demand that passes down through the layers of your bills and material. It'll be actual demand, actual demand. We do not use forecast in demand driven for replenishment. Okay. And this is the big change. We will use forecast to size buffers, but we do not use it for replenishment. So how does that work? There we go. Oh, there's a lag. Oh my gosh. Lag, lag, lag. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of a lag on. Yeah, there's on, a little bit of lag here. Yeah, I, I just figured it, I finally figured it out. Anyways, uh, so, what's, so basically what's happening is, uh, we so what do planners wanna know? What's coming in? What do I have? What demand do I have immediately? What demand is relevant? And here's our basic formula. This is our this is replaces the MRP projected available balance calculations. Uh, sorry to get technical, but um, on hand plus supply coming in plus any special sales orders over certain uh, with a certain qualification because the buffers of design are on average flow gives us a net flow. If the net flow is in uh, yellow, do we order? Uh, the graphics are a little off here. But if we order yes, uh, the, the replenishment is done. So basically we do this net flow calculation for all buffered parts every day. If it's below green, we replenish. How much do we replenish? What do you think? This rhetorical question to the group. Uh, do you replenish to here or do you replenish to here? Well, we replenish the top of green. And it is Kanban-like. Buffers from a replenishment point of view absolutely work with Kanban. And it's very powerful, but, but it's a dynamic Kanban which is what lean guys would, would acknowledge is a good way of doing it. Because a lot of times you've done Kanbans have very static Kanbans. So every day we calculate in the yellow and we can actually show reporting on this with some conditional formatting and software as well I'll do this for you. There we go. So here's the other big thing is, is a change. Because we have buffers, every buffer can give, every part can give us a color code of status. Okay. So basically, if the planning if the planning status is red, not good. The planning status is yellow, we're probably good. Planning status is green, we're fine, we no, don't need to order yet. But if it's in red, it's like, oh my God, you should be making sure orders are placed. And you can see the degree of penetration within the in individual buffers. So if it's at 27%, it's probably sitting down around here somewhere. That is, so if you have one part that's at 27%, another part that's 42%, which one comes first? 27%. So you have what's called a relative priority, and it gives us the ability to prioritize planning and execution scheduling 
from a date-based system to a priority color system. And this is a conceptual change uh, from MRP and finite scheduling systems uh, to, to this, and um, very powerful, okay? So buffer status is the big change. Okay, I'm waiting for my slide to, waiting for the slide to change here. Whoa. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so this is just a, a, a if you uh, get into some, uh, I'm going to show you some resources later about DDMRP training. Uh, this is an example of one of the simulation slides that we have. And um, um, softwares, uh, some of the softwares do this for you as well, either based on historical or, or on forecast. And you can actually uh, look at from an on-hand perspective and from a planning perspective, how in, how the buffer will 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 behave. And and this is very powerful. If you think about this, how do you do? This is like a control chart. Those who have taken lean or continuous improvement tools, you do. We've all talked about control charts on machines. This is an inventory control chart. I think this is cool. Then when I started getting my head around seeing this sort of stuff, it's wow. And this, it's easy to understand. It's easy to optimize. For example, you know, if you have a, if you, this is for one part, but if this part is constantly in the red, something is wrong. It means you haven't constructed your buffer properly. It, it, it maybe haven't added enough days of safety in the red. And um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's a good thing. So you can now visually see it. And this reminding me that I didn't touch on some part. The red zone is actually days of safety. Yellow zone is demand over lead time. And the green zone represents Kanban uh, replenishment batch and, uh, and and the frequency of replenishment. So there you go. So um, those who those who have uh, 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 Six Sigma or Lean tools, uh, the engineer, industrial engineer types or analysts can put inventory into a Pareto curve, do analysis. Obviously, you want to work on wherever it's way on this side, and when this side, we call that working on the tails. Because remember, we're trying to get the inventory in the green zone, which is sitting right around here. Um, okay. Here's another way of looking at it. Let's get that slide. Okay, so what are we trying to do? We're revisiting the fact because we have buffers, we now have a range. And that range is mathematically defined. It is, it is mathematically defendable. And um, you can now, because you have a range, you can do all sorts of things. You can do authorization, you can do capital investment analysis. You can actually start holding planners accountable to where's the inventory in the right, um, in the right range um, and is powerful. So this is one of the, this is one of the reasons why companies who implement DDMRP and do it, do it seriously um, get huge results because they have a tool and a methodology around a range. And, and the problem with traditional systems is you try to do this forecast to six, six decimal places three months out and feed this into a master schedule or an SMLP process, feed that in an MRP system, and you wonder why we don't get the right results. And because it is complex. And hopefully, we, so this system has kind of simplified the process around managing demand and um, around managing of inventory. So some of the benefits we're seeing globally um, so um, is, is the fact that there is a huge improvement in customer service. And, and usually we're saying uh, 97 to 100% lead time compression. What this means, what this means, because we focus on lead time, most companies do not ever look at their lead time standards in their MRP systems. I know they don't. And this is, this, for those who know MRP, it's that due date, release date, offset due date, release date. That's a huge thing. And what we do in our implementations, we 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 look at the lead time very scientifically. And we actually have tools. And as part of the DDMRP standard, um, we have the tools that look at bills of materials, and then we actually create segments within the lead, within those DOMs called uh, decoupled lead time, which is the longest unprotected chain where there's no inventory. And we actually make some decisions about stocking based on that chain. 
and uh, the tools actually help you do that. Okay. Um, obviously, right sizing inventories, we're seeing reported uh, in improvements up to 45%. I would say typically at least 10% reduction, which is unheard of in, in supply chain. Costs are down. Okay. So if you're not expediting so much, your costs are down and it's easy intuitive. I can give, uh, I can within a couple hours or a couple of days, I can teach anyone how to do this. It is easy and intuitive to do. And that's uh, an op, a kind of a, a, a change from the more complex tools that we've, the industry has been giving us. And uh, okay. So, and again, demand, you want to make note, Demand Driven Institute, this, this link will be coming up later, but there are uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of case studies in there that you can look at. It'll all talk about the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. And people who get involved with this get very passionate. Here's a study from a very large, this is an SAP consulting firm. By the way, SAP is really into DDMRP. Um, and at Camelot, it's a big um, European-based uh, consulting firm, SAP. I think there was over 20, uh, 20, 20 studies who've implemented DDMRP. Uh, they're saying they've got service level increasing 30 to 54%, lead time reductions 20, 22 to 85%. Oh my God, 85%? That is really hard to understand that. But those who have lean background know how much time is spent in waste and how much time is spent on mismanagement of the wrong parts, the wrong place, and the wrong time, which causes queuing, queuing problems in the manufacturing club. And inventory reduction is 30 to 60%. So um, um, very powerful results. Almost people going, what? When some of the stuff first started coming out, people went, what? It can't be true. And it's true. So who's doing this? So I, I recognize I recognize if you're going to go to your to the vice president or CEO and saying hey I want to do DMRP and they go hey what's that and you're going well and the next question comes well who's doing this well here you go you, a lot of you will recognize a lot of names on here all this comment I actually been involved with uh, stem cell actually the large biotech company in Canada and uh, they folding on DD DDMRP uh, tools uh, Bridge Telecom. Moog Aircraft Group, you may have heard it, but it's actually billing billion dollars. It's the largest first tier supplier to the aerospace, commercial, and military. I, I, I talked to a, a team of 10 people from Los Angeles. Michelin Tire is implementing through 75 manufacturing plants. And they're huge, they're, they're massive, and they're fully on, they're fully engaged in doing this. And then for them, if you, a tire manufacturing plant is all about changeovers, because they have dyes. You, uh, every individual type of tire is a dye changeovers and proper op lot size optimization so having ddmrp has really helped them calm that down uh oregon freeze-dried food is one of the most early adopters from 15 20 years ago this is the mountain house foods so they're pretty busy right now with everybody doing the survival food thing right uh bridge uh, shell lubricant systems um allergen with botox uh, louis Vuitton handbags I, i'm at the planner they're doing ddmrp pretty cool huh Coca-Cola Africa has got over 25 bottling plants fully on DDMRP. So just this is just a snapshot. And if you go to the Demand Driven Institute, you can see all the other companies that are doing this. And it's really exciting stuff. Big companies are doing this. Why? Because it gets results. Okay. And and the, the issue is you can spend a whole bunch of, you know, what is it? Every year you meet with your supply chain team, you create strategic objectives. And when you say, okay, we're going to reduce them to 25%, blah, blah, blah. And you create all these projects and then nothing happens or maybe it does happen. And then you're back to the same old place a year later. Well, DMRP creates incremental improvements way greater than 5%. And that's why it works. And it's easy to teach. And you can do this without a huge amount of investment of, of, of time and energy. And that's different between uh, some of the other tool and methodology. So, Roberta, I recognize um, a couple of names of companies on here, probably like most people do. Do you know? Um, are, do you know? Did these companies come from an existing MRP environment to DDMRP, or was it, um, you know, a legacy system like Reorder Point uh, um, and spreadsheets? I, I know that stem cell, uh, who, where I've been involved with this implementation, they did come from an MRP system. They were using visual manufacturing um, and they they converted. Um, I would say the general answer, I don't know the intimate de details, but they're obviously, they were using some planning systems, probably an MRP-like system, yes. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I recognize Unilever and Allergan. 
uh, and Shell as being companies that I've worked with in the past that that uh, did have an MRP system. So it's interesting to see how um, MRP uh, was being utilized and now it's been replaced with DDMRP and they're seeing further results. I think that's interesting. I should, I, I should clarify, we're not throwing out M MRP. Okay. We adjunct MRP with demand-driven planning, okay? We use MRP between layers of bombs that need, because we have MRP gives us that, MRP gives us that conversion of unit and measure between layers on the bills of materials, right? Um, but that planning is now DDMRP planning. We don't Thanks. use MRP planning. That's the big change, okay? So between buffer points within a bill of material structure, we use classic MRP. Okay. Very good. Getting, getting more complex and and i'm happy to anybody want to contact me i'm happy to show you how that works and um i'm going to give you some tools coming up coming up near you bill <laughs> tools to learn more <laughs> okay <laughs> so the next question is okay i want to do this do i have is there software um you could certainly i poo pooed excel spreadsheets you can certainly do ddmrp small ddmrp um, uh, implementations on the spreadsheet i'm happy to show you how if you want um, but if you're starting to push some significant parts and in inventory value, you probably want to get software. So there are software packages available for DDMRP. They all work the same because they're certified. Well, you can, can't see the, uh, the logo here, Demand Driven Institute. The Demand Driven Institute certifies the software. It's an auditing process. No money is exchanged, and they have a set of criteria based on all the rules I've been talking about is built in each of these tools. And you can see SAP is doing it. So if SAP is doing it, there's probably something to it, right? They, that is actually, it's in their S4 HANA, S4 HANA version. Um, um, so SAP is doing it. You can see all these different ones. Most, most ERP systems now have a, a, a bolt-on. Most of these will bolt on anything and some are natively built in, okay? Um, and I'll plug for Shea represents the B2Y's product and, and these two DDMRP for Cispro and DDMRP for Dynamic. So Shea represents these two products. I actually represent this product. So um, the replenishment plus, but um, just so that we, you know, we have a perspective of, of representations here in the, in the room today. But the good thing is 10 years ago, we had none or one or two. Okay. Now there's many. So why is software getting on board? It's because one, Sorry to my friends in software, they smell the money, but but the tools work and it helps businesses improve themselves. Okay, so it's pretty cool. And what it, so what does the software do? It helps you build all these buffers. It helps you manage the buffers. It helps you trigger the replenishments. It helps give you the control charts. It can help you do some of them have simulation capabilities of the buffer constructions. Very cool stuff. I don't even I can't even come up with them all. I'm very software techie. And I know I've seen maybe three or four of these in a little bit of detail. One of these I know intimately because I'm a trainer, but um, very cool, okay? Um, yeah, so that's really exciting. I think that that is really kind of a thing now that we're doing this and people going, oh my God, can, can I, it, it, it actually, I think shows the maturity of what's going with demand driven now. Okay, so how do you get started? This is Roberta's list, this is my list. This is for DIY, it should be DIY. Anyway, do it yourself. Get the textbook or go and and um, or go to the Demand Driven Institute site. Uh, you can just read free stuff, and you you can actually, if you if you feel that you have the the energy and the wherewithal, you can actually uh, learn to do this yourself without any consulting support or any software. If you want, if you want, um, you the next step it would be to take a Demand Driven Planner class or Demand Driven Leader class. Um, it's from the Demand Driven Institute. I offer these classes uh, online right now. I have the next class starting uh, later in May, last week of May, uh, four Fridays. There is a self-study class. Uh, there's a self-study class available uh, for about uh, five, $600. Uh, email me for a major discount. I'll give you my email in a sec. Shea is more than happy to have, uh, help you. They've got both software and consulting. Uh, go to the Demand Driven Institute site. Join the site. It's free to join. And you get added content, in which case you'll get case studies, white papers. You can see all the certified software and then all the links to the different softwares. Okay. And then I would recommend you do a pilot. Okay. Do a pilot. Um, pick, pick. Quite often we would recommend maybe starting in procurement because that's usually an isolated department, anyways, that's used to working on its own. And you pick half a dozen parts and you can actually, I've had, I had one company, they actually built a little, um, they built a little visual 
visual uh, visual tool with uh, Visual Basic, and they piloted 25 parts for three months. And they got and started asking. They learned about how the rules of DDMRP works. And they were comparing it to their standard systems, and they got very comfortable with it. And they, now they're it's one of our clients, and we're fully implementing. It. So pretty cool. So there you go. That's my how do you get started list. Uh, some links. So here's the Demand Driven Institute link. This is my link. So feel for, please please email me if you want a further discussion demo. Uh, uh, training inquiry, whatever, just if I can help you get on the path. I represent Demand Driven in Canada. For those in Canada, I have uh, contacts in the U.S. and have U.S. resources as well, and um, and European. And uh, she uh, has lots of stuff as well. This is the book. You want to, if you're really kind of a textbook planner techie type, get this book. Work your way through it. It's it's, it's pretty. It's going to be pretty deep for you. Uh, this is the basic class. If you want to start, this is the basic two-day class, and uh, that's how you get started. And I, I think I'm at the end of where I'm supposed to be. And uh, wow, look at that! Look at that timing, perfect. So thank you for having me. I think that's where I'm supposed to be there. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you very much for sharing uh, this great information today. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and take a few questions. Uh, just a reminder to anyone online, um, please be sure to submit your questions through the Q&A panel on the GoToWebinar console. Um, looks like we have a couple coming through. Um, yeah, so first question. Uh, this one's a little bit tricky. Uh, it came in a little bit earlier, so I had to reword a little bit. So I apologize uh, to the person who submitted it. Um, you feel free to um, submit the question again for clar uh, just to provide some clarification, but I'll, I'll try to read it through, Roberta. Um, so considering today's dynamic business environment, how would you manage the following situation? Where two or more of your brands are positioned to compete against each other, and at the same time against a strong competitor's brand. What would be some of the priorities that you would use in DDMRP to maintain market leadership? Well, that's a pretty deep question for a, for a Thursday Cer morning. Certainly is, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, brand, brand management and brand and marketing management and decision to play in a brand space, that's a CRM sales marketing decision. And it's kind of independent to DDMRP, right? Okay, so if I want to have, so you're going to have two brands competing, they're fine. Do they compete? Now, how does DDMRP help you help with that that scenario? The different different brands require different products. Different products would have different buffer constructions and different. Uh, and we could, let's say, a brand had 30 products in it as a family of of grouping. You could roll up if you've defined inventory buffers for the 30. You could roll them up into a total family total and compare that one brand to another brand, okay? Now, whether you sell one brand or another brand, that's that's a that's a leadership decision on based on gross profit, market share, that's kind of way out of the scope of a DDMRP, but DDMRP will give you the operational controls to support the brands, to whatever the decision is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I think that, that there's a lot of, um, sales and marketing content in that question that positioning two products against each other uh, against competitors uh, i've done that before myself and usually uh, usually it's an internal battle with the sales and marketing team to to compete as well um, and then of course understanding who your competitors are and building that brand messaging to your market is extremely important from a supply chain perspective i would i would probably add to that you know i think and I think you would agree, Roberta, is, you know, making sure that you, um, you know, depending on which of the two brands you're competing uh, against, you know, inventory levels can 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 um, influence the way customers um, use your products or consume your products. So in other words, uh, maybe one has a higher safety stock than others and higher, higher availability. Um, uh, pricing can influence that kind of decision too, from a customer's perspective. Um, so there, I, I think there's a there's a broader set of set of uh, uh, analysis that can be done outside of DDMRP as well. But from a supply chain perspective, I think it's really making decisions around how you want to carry your inventory too, right? 
Yep. Uh, demand driven also has a layer of what's called demand driven adaptive enterprises where you're using the tactical buffer constructions as a, just an influence in strategic decisions. And basically it's as you know, leadership through standard SNLP is deciding which which brand, which which lines do you push forward, which ones do you restrict restrict back, how do you allocate if there's a capacity issue, how do you allocate capacity? It's still all the decisions are all pretty much the same, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Thanks. Um, question number two, in slide 29, you talked about the difference between interpreting priorities in DDMRP versus how MRP assigns priorities, i.e. due dates. Can you expand on that? Great question. And this is one of the paradigms is that we've, uh, so basically MRP logic, uh, for, the, for, for who have asked the question obviously understands MRP logic. So the MRP logic goes through release date, offsetting on standard lead time, Release, uh, sorry, due date, release date, due date, release date, through, through down through the bills and materials if it's needed. And it's all date-based, it's all date-based. So what we do in demand-driven is we now, uh, the buffers are positioned to support the business already. So it's kind of like it's already planned to be there. So then we just have to now make sure the buffers are protected. How do we protect a buffer? We make sure we replenish when we're supposed to replenish it. And which one gets done first? If there's a conflict in capacity, the one that's deep, the deepest in the buffer. And um, the problem with due dates is you don't know whether it's a due date from a forecast generated issue, you don't know if it's a due date from a, a safety stock replenishment issue, or you don't know if it's a due date from a maker order issue. The dates are a date, right? And it's really confusing. And I know having done this, I've worked in date management systems, it's noisy and crazy and people um, sometimes get really buried by that. Some companies get, can get it going quite well, but with demand driven, we kind of, not that we don't throw out the dates, we still use them, but the ability to which is made first, which has to be made first is based on a work order or purchase order feeding into a buffer. That's a fundamental difference from a date management and hopefully that answers the question. Hmm, very good, very good. Uh, question number three, um, the person is referring to the Camelot slide um, and saying that you showed some industry benchmark data. Is there a place that they can go to get the benchmark metrics by their industry vertical? I guess they didn't see the industry there were, there were There were columns. Uh, there were columns in there. Uh, I would Google, you could Google Camelot Consulting and, and see what they have on their website. Um, I'm not aware of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that slide actually did have uh, some industry, those three other columns in there I didn't review. They were actually industry specific uh, results. Um, um, I'd have to think, I can't think of offhand words or a good summary by industry right now. I don't, um, I don't know. Okay, well, um, if you do think of something, let us know. We'll be happy to send that out to the person who asked the question as well. Uh, question number four. Um, I think this was a uh, maybe something that came up. What does right sizing inventory mean? I think it was something that was on one of the slides. What does right sizing inventory mean, and what does that mean for my physical inventory versus availability? Um, well, right sizing inventory means getting the right stuff for the right place at the right time. So we can have a discussion about how does safety stock do that versus what demand driven buffers uh, do that. So with buffers, you have a much clearer uh, view of what the right sized inventory is. There is a mathematical formula from each of the buffer constructions that give us the amount of inventory that we will have uh, on average. And it actually is top of red plus half of green. And from that, um, we can actually get financial perspectives. Now you're, you're the, the second part of the question was availability was uh, availability versus what, uh, Bill? What was I? Uh, physical inventory level versus availability. So I guess there's a. Uh, I guess they're looking for a balance between inventory Cost. investment and okay. Okay. yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah. Well, the nice thing about I can I know having with this having experience in this having having the how do you plan inventory levels with any other system with MRP or MinMax or whatever? How do you plan a number? How do you know what the average inventory is? This is kind of a guess, right? And you maybe use forecast, maybe you do one half batch size plus one half lead time plus standard deviation, blah, blah, blah. And that's fine. With demand-driven buffers, you have an exact 
number. Well, what I mean by exact number, you, you can get a average number, okay, which is, which is defendable. The math within how buffers work and how they manage replenishment makes the result very, um, very defendable in terms of getting a number. So availability, the fact you've put a buffer in place means you're going to have availability close to 100%. That's the basis of a buffer, okay? Uh, the result of capital from a buffer is usually we're seeing, well, pretty much in all cases in demand driven, we're seeing a res reduction of, of capital. Okay. Hmm. Capital invested in the inventory. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm going to rely on some of my experience just to uh, dialogue with you a little bit here. Um, to many of the companies that I've worked for in the past or worked with in the past, um, that sort of came up as well. So there's there's a lot of, uh, a lot of cases where, you know, maybe the first time you introduce a inventory management strategy that follows Apex thinking or some of the other uh, body of knowledge uh, related to it, um, there tends to be a lot of as you sort of point out, uh, inventory toward the tails, right? Um, not enough yeah. of one thing, yeah. too much of another yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, it doesn't necessarily align very well to the forecast, or maybe maybe it's the re result of a of a bad forecast um, at some point. So uh, that tends to be some of the common situations in companies that don't have a have a um, a uh, a good inventory management strategy or a system that has good foundations within it, like uh, like we're talking about here. Um, um, you raise you, Bill and I were talking to Rika Abbott in a one hour discussion of this because this this is kind of really key to my heart here. So let's just very quickly. I'm going to talk really fast because I think it's important to understand this. The Apex or the industry standard um, systems have been around. It says you got a forecast. I mean, you may you may master schedule and you feed into and you feed into um, feed an MRP system and then you manage you manage with all the nervousness with action messages and then it comes along safety stocks and they started having tuning models around safety stocks and uh, we could have a debate whether a safety stocks hurt or help the nervousness with an MRP system okay well with demand driven we kind of replace all that with a, a cleaner a cleaner easier to manage system around inventory. Now the question the question is why does MR why do people have problems with their inventory systems? One, over reliance on forecasts. Two, the fact that safety stocks are not calculated properly and they exacerbate the planning signals and people can't separate them out. Three, MRP by itself is a nervous calculated system because it assumes everything is perfect and it is not perfect. And um, and and then with, if you have complex planning systems, then people start using spreadsheets and now it exacerbate the problem. So mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Thanks, Roberta. And one last question. We're getting uh, we're at twelve twenty-five almost. Uh, so last question here. Um, understanding that change management is is uh, not an easy thing to overcome. What is yeah. the best way to approach introducing DDMRP with my company and my leaders? And I think you touched briefly on that, but maybe you could expand yeah. on it. Well, it's like any change management project. You have to have uh, support from the top. Um, and uh, I find it actually, if there's interest with leadership, I find it a really easy sell. And I'm, I'm putting myself like a, like a, if I'm a supply chain manager or an inventory manager and says, hey, you go to the VP and you go, hey, I got this new thing. And, and oh my God, and they go, another new thing, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Show them uh, there's some 10 minute videos. There are some 10 minute videos uh, that you can get off the Demand Driven Institute site. Find one that has Carol in it. Uh, Carol Patak is one of the founders of Demand Driven Institute. Her stuff is excellent. Um, know that Demand Driven Institute has partnered with Apex ASCM. It is now a recognized body of knowledge. So if this is not some crazy new lean thing. And so I should not say that. My guys, some great, great friends and lean and great tools. But it's some some companies have great systems that are kind of different than the industry standard. So it is easy to explain. Um, there is, uh, you can take the course, uh, one of the courses or self-study course, learn all the basics yourself. Um, I'm sure many of the consultants around the world would be happy to interact with you and your, and your organization. Um, get a demo, get a demo of the software. It's always good. A lot of the consulting firms will, including my own, uh, we will take your demand, we'll take your demand supply history and roll it into our tool and give you a snapshot with all the buffers constructed and everything. So you can see it that way. Um, very good, very good. And I think you also talked about um, in your slide, 
uh, previously was was do a do a pilot right uh, take a sample of some data and pilot it and see what the differences between what you're doing today and what might be accomplished with DDMRP yep very good um, that's all the questions that we have, Roberta. Um, anybody uh, online that has additional questions to add, please feel free to um, submit them through email to us. Uh, we'd be happy to respond. Um, we're just coming up on the last part here. So thank you for everyone uh, for attending the webinar today. If you're interested in learning more about DDMRP um, and Roberta as well, um, to support your supply chain initiatives, please feel free to connect us, uh, connect to us through the following website, email address and or phone number. Um, also, please visit our website for more information on future events at Shea. Uh, and we thank you for participating today, Roberta. Uh, thank you for all of your information and your input and the discussion. Oh. Fantastic discussion today. Um, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.